Welcome to Celebrating Act Two, where today John and I are speaking with Dr. Liz Lister. Hey, good morning, Dr. Liz. Good to see you. Good morning. Good morning, gentlemen. Likewise. Uh, Dr. Liz, we were talking to our old friend, Grace. Uh, that is not a pejorative, by the way. She is old, but she's an old friend. A long yes, time, John, a long time, a, a friend, long time friend. Yes. We were, we were talking about the common uh, phenomenon that we all seem to have after a certain age. She called it the, the doorway syndrome. In other words, you okay. go through the door and you ask yourself, wait uh, a minute, what did I come into this room for? <laughs> yep. I call that destinesia, but okay. That's good. <laughs> so that that kind of memory loss, you know, it's momentary. And uh, I, her theory was you could walk back through the door and you'd remember, you know, and that, that never works for me. But <laughs> it, that short memory loss, is that a sign of something more serious, dementia? Should we be worried when we have this this kind of, uh, um, what do they call it, an age, a, a, a senior yes. moment? Right, exactly, exactly. Well, so first of all, it's a great question. It's a really common question. I get asked that all the time. Uh, people get worried uh, if they're forgetting, they can't retrieve names really quickly or having issue with word retrieval, that type of thing. Yep. And that is actually not a sign of impending dementia. And it is not, for example, like an early stage of dementia. Oh, good. Yes, it is very good news. Another perspective that I always like to offer on this is that of a book that I read recently, which talks about ageism. And one of the points that she makes is that young people forget stuff also, hmm. not just for seniors. Yeah. Another point that she makes that I really like, this was from a study that was done where someone who is 60 years old has met a lot more people than someone who is 30 years old. Therefore, they're looking for that name from a much larger database. Oh, I like that excuse. Mm -hmm. Yes, this I is like shown that. in That's a study. A it's this is not an excuse. This is a scientific fact. Really? They okay. did they did a study and they gave people a hundred words and they needed to retrieve one or two of those words to answer a question. Then yeah. they gave them five hundred words and they had to retrieve one or two words to answer a question. And then they gave them a thousand words and the more words they gave them to look sure. through, the longer it took. And of course, it, we're talking about one second instead of 0.5 seconds, but we're also talking mm. about studies that can measure these fine differences. Right. Okay, so I really like that. And I've been saying that to a lot of people uh, since I read about that to reassure them. We, well, we just have more information in there to sort through when we're trying to think of that name or trying to retrieve that word. Right. And and we we I call that a temporary memory loss. It, it's not necessarily memory loss, is it? That's right. Yeah. That's uh, right. So what what is dementia then? Dementia okay. is something a lot more serious. Yes, that's exactly right. First of all, I want to point out that dementia is only one illness that is associated with memory loss. So it's also very important when people experience memory loss or you know someone who you can tell is experiencing memory loss, there's a number of things it can be due to. There could be other neurological issues going on that have to be assessed and ruled out. There can be head trauma that can result in that in the short or later term future. Medication side effects, mm. that's very common, especially yeah antidepressants, anti-seizure medications, those medications dampen the activity of the brain and therefore they can slow down cognitive function as a side effect. Yeah. Also hypothyroidism is associated with a, sometimes with a little bit of memory loss. Patients describe it to me as brain fog, a little yeah. bit of fogginess and also some mental illnesses, not all mental illnesses, but for example, depression is associated with some degree of memory loss, Yeah. right? So dementia is a constellation of features, uh, decline in cognitive function. Usually people are not aware 
of the decline. Yeah. If people, if if you realize that you are experiencing memory loss, that's actually a really good sign. That's interesting. It's it's when people are unaware of their memory loss that that is a predictor of future decline and possible onset of dementia. Yeah, and and I I when I hear the word dementia, I kind of think of people who are out of it. Um, That's right. Yeah, exactly. They're not only yeah. not aware that they have memory loss; they're just not aware of quite every. You know, they're just slow on the uptake. They're not aware of everything, in a in a sense. Exactly. To one degree or another. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, and, uh, uh, Dr. Liz, it was uh, appeared to me though that this uh, topic that we're discussing now is more important for people to be an observer of others as opposed to, well, I'll learn about myself because if the person who is experiencing things that, and I think there's a, a wide range of things we all lump together, Alzheimer's, dementia, and a right. lot, lots of those kinds of things, Park, even Parkinson's. I mean, there are so many different things in there uh, rather than just what Parkinson's and shakes. There's so many other things that go along with it um, uh, for right. people who have serious problems that, it's to observe others because they can't observe them themselves. But this is a question, uh, I guess, and I know we've touched on it in the past a little bit, but I think it's worth uh, uh, reviewing again. Are most doctors that you go to see on a regular basis, I call them GPs, okay? I, they want family doctors or uh, whatever, family practice, whatever it is. Uh, are they aware enough in, to begin to get a sense for whether or not one of their patients is having problems without somebody referring stuff to them? That's a very good question. I do not know the answer to that of what's happening, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. What I do know is that there are some screening tests that can be done when people go to their general doctor, some basic questions that can be answered so that way they have an indication. And then, of course, there's a lot of evaluation that can be done with all kinds of different assessments, memory tests, grocery lists, all mm. sorts of tests that are used are called activity of daily living testing. And it's for the purpose of assessing cognitive decline. So there are concrete ways to assess it. It's not just a family member thinking that that is happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a kind of an outlier of a question. When people are uh, experiencing cognitive decline, do you have any indication, any, any studies or anything to tell you what the general reaction is? In other words, I'm, I'm losing it. And okay. I may, may or may not be quite aware of it, but my general reaction is, no, I'm fine. I, I, in other words, I get defensive about it. Is that is that common sure. or is it more common for people to be, let's say, so out of it they don't even know they're out of it? Well, it, it generally progresses in stages. And as we were just saying, if the person is aware of what's happening, that helps. That helps the whole process. It helps the diagnosis. It helps the assessment and it helps the future prognosis of what's gonna happen. Okay, so a person who's aware, that's a good sign, that's yeah. helpful. When they're less aware or they're not aware, that unfortunately is not as good of a sign. Yeah, yeah. and makes it difficult for everybody. And makes, that's exactly yeah. right. It can really make it difficult. I wanted to also share a Meta-analysis, a meta-analysis, I, I think we've talked about this, it's a study that assesses studies. Mm -hmm. And they, they, put, they put together, they reviewed 396 studies. Wow. That's a huge meta-analysis. Yeah. And they came up with a list of factors that are related to dementia, related to memory loss, that are modifiable things that you can actually influence and change. And they came up with 104 modifiable wow. factors. Yeah, which is very good news. Yeah. They Luckily, they narrowed it down, and I don't have that list of 104 to share with everybody today. 
Uh, but they did narrow it down. And what I did want to share is that the modifiable factors include things that you would imagine. If you have high blood pressure, getting that under control. If you're overweight or obese, doing what you can in that department. Yeah. Metabolic dysfunction, which can include diabetes, uh, getting stress under control. Okay. They also considered things like educational level as a modifiable factor. Now, that's not modifiable on an individual basis. I can't go back and change the education that I had in the past. Right. However, when we look at it across the board, that is definitely associated. So people with lower educational attainment, lower, educa lower educational level was associated with more cognitive decline. Interesting. Mm. So it would, I would get from that as a layman, I would interpret that as um, higher activity, brain activity, which is I, I associate with education as opposed yes. to, it, as opposed to innate smarts, you know, you can be smart and just not be educated. Yes. Correct. Uh, but if you're educated, you've had a lot of brain activity. Yes. And I agree. That to me goes along with, forget the education for a minute, goes along with things like doing the Sudoku puzzle. That's right. <laughs> the crossword puzzle. No matter that's what right. age you are, if, you're at, if right. your brain is active, that's what we're talking about here, would be a good thing. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And also the body, keeping the body active. We talked about this, the brain and the body yeah. interact with each other. Learning new things is going to be helpful. Yeah. A one point that I really wanted to emphasize is that lack of sleep is a very high predictor of cognitive decline. Very, very important. We I always talk about this, protecting your sleep, taking care of your sleep, yeah. sleep hygiene. We've talked about that. Yeah. Uh, so that's very, very important. The concern with the sleeping medications, for example, like sleeping pills, it probably turns out the latest data that I'm aware of is probably points that points to the fact that the problem is not the pill or the medication, but the lack of sleep that it was treating. Ah, uh, mm. yeah. So yeah. that is that is the latest that I tell my patients. If you need some support, if you can use natural supplements, then that's great. But if you need sleeping medications, prescriptions to help then that is better than not sleeping. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'd like to ask, um, so for anybody in the audience who's watching this, who suspects that their spouse or a loved one or a friend might be having more than just temporary um, uh, memory loss, uh, how, how, how is an intervention, a useful intervention uh, approach I mean, is there a certain kind of doctor to see? What's the kind of steps that somebody could take to try to find out uh, if somebody is uh, suffering from uh, something beyond uh, a, a local memory loss? That is usually in the neurology department. Mm -hmm. And so they may or may not need a referral to be able to see a neurologist, but that's usually where the more thorough testing is performed. So you go to your that's doctor? That's where people... That's where your doctors need to go. say, yeah, do a quick screen and give us, give, refer exactly. us to a neurologist. Yeah. Exactly. Now, neurology and psychiatry are the same boards. So sometimes there's overlap, right? And a psychiatrist may also be involved with assessing some of those confounding conditions, mm -hmm. the side effects of medications, uh, treating depression. And I want to also put a comment in for social interaction okay. that that probably in my view is where one of the places that social interaction helps our health is with our cognitive health cognitive function interesting yeah so if wow. someone has loneliness as a component of depression and they're able to improve on that and develop social connections uh, not have that loneliness then, and not have that depression, that is definitely going to help with cognitive function. Hmm. Well, wow. it certainly hmm. is a D 
deep, deep subject. And, yeah. uh, uh, and important that, and lots of good news. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say, I forget why we came here. Oh. Well, well you know, sorry. I, wait, did, did you step out while Dr. Liz was speaking and go through the doorway? I can help <laughs> you with that. You want to get more coffee. Yeah. Anyway, thank you again, Dr. Liz. And uh, it's just, it's enlightening and it's important to notice this, not so much in yourself, but in others. Temporary, yeah. momentary loss, doorway syndrome. What did you call that, Dr. Liz? Destinesia. Destina Destinesia. Destinesia. So, Destinesia. So if you're suffering from either Destinesia or uh, doorway syndrome, that's probably <laughs> okay. If you're suffering from something else, you probably don't know. But your friend who has watched this video does, and yeah. uh, there are things that can be done. And then to at least slow it down or to recognize it and take some therapeutic action. So again, Dr. Liz, as always, thank you for uh, uh, enlightenment and uh, helping us live healthier, longer lives. Great information. Thank you so much. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.